Good morning, everyone. This is Brad Adams. I am the website chair uh, for the Tennessee chapter of HFMA. Um, you've probably seen my name in various emails, especially if you've had questions or problems getting connected. I think I've managed to respond to everyone who contacted me this morning. Um, so it is my pleasure today uh, to do the introductions. And before I get to that, I want to provide a couple of, of quick housekeeping items for everyone. So um, we are recording the webinars, so in case you miss one or want to go back and review, you'll be able to do that. Um, they're going to be up on the Tennessee Chapters uh, YouTube channel, um, which is uh, you know youtube.com slash TNHFMA, um, or you can get the link to it from our website as well. Um, as far as your CPE certificates go, we will be issuing those at the end of the webinar series. Um, in order to receive credit for each of the two-hour sessions, um, you need to be connected uh, to the session for, for pretty much the entire time. I think it has to be at least 90% of the time, and you'll also have to respond to polling questions um, throughout um, that, that will launch, and you'll be able to, to respond to on your, on your computer or your iPad or your phone or however you're connected with us today. Um, and there's links to the policies and stuff on the webinar information. Um, but those are the two things that are required by uh, NASBA, which is our CPE accreditation um, institution that we comply with. And so if we don't have those two things for everybody, we cannot issue you CPE for that particular day. Um, if you've got questions as we go through the webinar today, um, you can submit those in the questions section um, on your on your uh, in your little control panel though you'll see for the webinar um, and then uh, one of us will be getting back with you um, today's moderator is going to be Valerie Woodbury Valerie is the certification chair um, here in the Tennessee chapter and she works down the road from me at Ardent Health so you'll hear Valerie uh, coming in and out throughout this session and helping uh, Christoph with the polling questions um, and so with that I want to go ahead and introduce uh, do a quick introduction Christoph Studer um, is our uh, speaker for this series. Uh, Christoph did this for us about this time last year as well, um, to great success. Um, so we're repeating this again this year, and we've actually added a handful more of uh, chapters in addition to the four that sponsored this last year. Um, so Christoph has worked with HFMA on this. He understands the test, particularly the new formats, um, and I think this is going to be a great benefit to everyone who... Uh, who is wanting to become certified uh, with HFMA. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christoph. So, Christoph, take it away. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Brad and Valerie uh, as well. And welcome to all of you out there uh, in the various offices and uh, the home offices or on the road or wherever you are. Um, we have an an amazing number of chapters represented the 10 chapters that originally came together uh, to organize these webinars but as I look at the most recent uh, sign-up sheet there are also members from three other chapters uh, here and, and their state birds are unfortunately not on this page there are uh, members from West Virginia Missouri and Gulf Coast HFMA or signed up for the, this webinar series as well. Uh, uh, five non-members also, and uh, I want to extend a special hello to one person, Toya Jones, who works for the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and she is joining us as well. And, as well, and I ought to have a falcon on this page uh, just for her. What we're going to do here for these uh, next few weeks uh, at this same time and place every week uh, will um, allow us to motor through the entire curriculum for the CHFP exam. We're going to do that in four two-hour blocks and then have a, uh, a cram session after that. The intent is uh, to really prepare you for the, uh, taking this exam. Hopefully, 
uh, you have the time and energy to do this uh, by the end of April, uh, which is the time when National HFMA stops the clock to see how uh, chapters and members are doing in regards to certification. And in some cases, uh, chapters may have asked you to make a commitment to do that. In any case, whether, whether uh, you are planning to take this test by the end of April or sometime later this year, I encourage you to stick with it and uh, do this. It's one of the best things you can do, I feel, for yourself and uh, your career. Uh, and not just uh, in so far as it uh, adds four letters behind your name, but uh, in that it uh, um, grounds your uh, professional knowledge in our field uh, in, in a considerable way and gives you, I think, the confidence to speak on an, an, a range of issues that uh, you might otherwise not. So this isn't just about the exam, this is I think in part about job satisfaction, the feeling that you are a master, or that you can master this uh, growing body of knowledge and uh, have a, a solid foundation in it. Some of us studied some of this material uh, in college or graduate school. There is some overlap with the, the CPA exam but uh, most of us learned uh, what we know about healthcare finance uh, the hard way on the job. And that means that it's kind of hit or miss. It's, it's whatever we picked up and, and we try to integrate it and we expand on it as we go to seminars or listen to webinars or uh, read the HFMA magazine. But uh, this is a, a unique opportunity to step back and uh, um, build the, the, the framework around it and then go deep into the subject as well. So uh, this is in part uh, kind of a graduate level uh, class in, that you might uh, encounter in an MHA program. Uh, in part it's a little bit review of what you may have done in an MBA program or uh, undergraduate program but it's in all of these cases uh, uh, what you would have learned there is different in that it is not as grounded in practice as what you are about to experience it's what makes this I think fun and unique so welcome to this uh, series and thank you for the commitment of time you're devoting uh, to this. Now you have received, I, I hope, or at least most of you will have received in one way or another a big fat uh, book called the HFMA Certification Practicum. This is the title page for it right here. This book started as a less than an inch worth of paper when I taught my first class like this uh, three years ago to uh, fellow members in my own chapter in Oregon and it has grown steadily ever since uh, to a point uh, where I'm afraid I'm going to have to take material out rather than allow it to grow any larger. Um, so this text is uh, a companion to these webinars and I want to show you how it is organized. Uh, you may not have had much opportunity yet to to take a look at it. The only thing that's wrong here on this agenda is that is the time slot we, we're starting on the half hour, not as I thought on the full hour here. Um, there is a table of contents here which um, shows you how this book is organized. So the first tab, there should be five tabs in your book. First tab is called pre-readings. Since you haven't had this book for long, I certainly don't expect you to have pre-read the financial reporting section, which we're starting with today. And I don't really expect you, uh, even for these other webinars, to have pre-read uh, any of these other sections. But at some point, uh, you're going to have to look at this material before you take the exam. And before the webinars is as, as good a time as any, or if you don't, uh, get a chance to do that, then I encourage you while the knowledge is fresh to do it shortly thereafter. So there's a couple hundred pages here on pre-readings. Um, 
followed then by my slides, and I already showed you the first slide here. Actually, I'm not going to follow the slides much. Uh, this is in that sense different from a, a typical webinar, which is a PowerPoint presentation. This is a, a real kind of uh, roll up your sleeves learning, and I um, find it too difficult to go back and forth between the detailed text, which I think is important for you to see on the screen, and then what I what we're doing with uh, case studies and uh, uh, and lecture materials. In any case, there's a set of uh, PowerPoints here that might be a use for um, organizing principle or way to review this material. And there are some case studies. Uh, HFMA has created uh, its own set of case studies. They are available to certification chairs on the HFMA website. Uh, I expanded considerably on the ideas represented uh, by those uh, case studies uh, that HFMA has published. So these are all different. There are 18 case studies here. They're quite different and much more elaborate than anything you would see uh, on the HFMA website for chapter use. And we will not have time to do all of these case studies. Uh, you will see this right away today. But they are there for you to uh, practice what you're learning and also to see practical applications of this knowledge to real life situations in the workplace. Then I have model solutions. Everything in the case studies is solved for you and shown in the model solutions. Uh, then at the end, I uh, added uh, some articles from the HFMA magazine that amplify and extend the materials that we're talk we have time to talk about. It's optional for you to look at them. I chose uh, them uh, according to uh, certain criteria. There's some articles on the revenue cycle that are not brand new articles. They're in some cases uh, a few years old, but they're very excellent statements about the revenue cycle. Then I have a number of articles uh, that are quite contemporary on um, the role of uh, value, uh, the, the, the new drive for value in healthcare and how um, value is measured uh, and how it is applied in, uh, today in healthcare, uh, finance, and in contracting. So that's there for you at the end in case you are interested. Now you may ask, how is this material different from the online HFMA study guide. Uh, let me just go through this here quickly uh, and show you this particular page. The HFMA has published a, uh, a study guide that's online. You can subscribe to it for a year for $249 or you can download it as an ebook for a higher price, maybe $100 more. I'm forgot what the price is, that's something new. This study guide uh, uh, carries uh, 10 hours of CPE. Uh, our classes have eight hours of CPE. The online study guide has uh, uh, a test at the end. You see it here where I'm wiggling with my mouse, CSERT Healthcare Finance Core Curriculum Final Test. It's a test of, I. I don't remember uh, exactly, maybe 70 or 75 questions. Uh, it is not representative of the actual exam. It's much easier and the types of questions are also not representative of the actual exam. So you're welcome if you have it to uh, read it alongside of what we're doing here. I'm not uh, um, as, suggesting that you must do that. It's just another way through this material organized a little bit differently uh, than, I, than I teach my webinars. I show this to you here on this screen. This is uh, uh, one of the first screens of the financial reporting module and it has um, uh, four parts and what we're doing today is 
part one here, understanding financial statements, of course, we're doing that. But then you see part two is ratio analysis and variance analysis. I split those two. We're doing ratio analysis today, and we're doing variance analysis next week. Then if I look at the budgeting and forecasting module, which is the topic of next week's webinar, notice that part four is ratio analysis and financial analysis techniques. So I organize this material a little bit differently. I pull these two racial sections out of these different modules together and then defer variance analysis until next week. The, um, uh, this, um, so the exam on this test is, uh, is unlike the real exam and it, it uh, um, particularly is true of quantitative questions. There are a lot of quantitative questions on the exam and very few quantitative questions on the the uh, test is attached to this online study guide. Um, and so my approach to the webinars is to focus very much on the quantitative materials. You probably don't need more narrative uh, uh, introductions to budgetary control here or what the components of a budget are or what the budgeting process is. Uh, what you might want help with are the, uh, the, the calculations that go with it insofar as they're tested on the exam. So that is going to be my focus and I organized my materials and I'm going to go back now, now to the uh, table of contents here, I organized my material in descending order of complexity. So what we're doing today is financial reporting. That is to me and maybe to others the hardest part of uh, the CHFP exam. Uh, you, what you will see are data sets, uh, two or three data sets of numbers and uh, you'll be asked to calculate certain ratios. So you have to remember the, memorize the formula and then apply it to a model financial statement. That's hard if you don't do this kind of thing every day and there are lots of formulas to learn. So we're starting off with, with this topic and I hope it won't uh, scare you away because I promise the materials get easier as we proceed through the webinars. The topic of next week is budgeting and forecasting. That is, to me, the second hardest topic, again, because it's got some quantitative stuff in it that you just have to learn uh, if you've forgotten it. And then we do the last of the big three topics, that's the revenue cycle. It has some computations in it as well, but the revenue cycle is just a big complex thing. And so that's why these three topics, financial reporting, budgeting and forecasting and revenue cycle are kind of the big three. And then the last three topics of the curriculum or the knowledge areas are internal control, which includes compliance, a big topic, contract management, and uh, the, the caboose here is disbursements. All three of these we are going to do in a single webinar. You can see this here if I go back to the agenda here. You're going to see on March the 27th we're going to do all of those three topics at once and you may wonder why we can afford to do um, uh, in one class uh, something that represents third to even more of the exam you see this down here. It's because I think this is the easiest material and uh, hopefully we'll agree. So we're a little bit lopsided here in how we divide uh, the topics up. You're allowed to bring a calculator. Uh, don't come with a, a printing calculator or a graphing calculator or something that'll scare the people at the testing center. You bring your trusty old little calculator or even you can bring a business calculator if you want to. There is a calculator function built into the testing software at the CASEL International websites, uh, testing sites, but it's a very small and dinky little thing, hard to operate and uh, I, I was told no you can't bring a calculator so I left mine in the locker and uh, only later did I realize uh, 
that I, I was entitled to, to bring mine and I should have. It's just that you're more familiar with, uh, with it than operating with a mouse on a little calculator on the screen. So that's okay. kind of the preliminaries. Um, and uh, we have the, you have the ability to raise your hand and ask questions and, and that's uh, uh, Brad's role and also Valerie's to watch that. It's something that uh, I am not able to watch uh, as I teach this. So uh, make, uh, uh, um, take advantage of the ability to raise your hand and ask a question in, in the question box. You're also encouraged to chat amongst yourselves if you're interested, if, uh, if someone wants to ask the group a question that can work out very well. And uh, you can interrupt me at any time. I'm happy to take your questions at any time. When I teach this class or these classes in a live setting, it's of course very interactive. I can see you, you can see me. Oh, we can get quite a dialogue going. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury uh, on the webinars. Uh, so it relegates you somewhat to a passive role, but you can help yourself by asking questions or chatting amongst each other. Christoph, this is Valerie. So, we, we do have yes. a question at this time. Um, before sure. you get started, is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, so um, Nick Samilo, and mm -hmm. I, I will unmute him. Perfect. Let's see if that works. Well, I have no question. I'm sorry. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. <laughs> Make one okay. up, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's get started then. We are going to uh, um, be deeply involved in the, the book, okay? So I'm going to not go the route of the, the, the uh, overheads here where I give you this wonderful picture of ratios in, in aesthetics and in history and in, in, in nature and in engineering, but we're, we're going to go instead uh, really uh, dig into, into the whole topic of financial statement analysis and ratios. So for those of you in the audience who are finance folks, this is going to be old hat. For those of you who are revenue cycle people or uh, work in other realms of our large kingdom of healthcare finance, uh, some of this may be a, a little bigger hurdle. So we are going to start looking at financial statements and kind of uh, uh, use this as a springboard to talk about ratios. But we're going to first spend a little bit of time on uh, understanding and reviewing financial statements. So financial statements, it's always plural because they consist of a number of different uh, schedules and they also sh always show a couple of years. So they're always uh, referred to as financial statements rather than a financial statement. And we're looking here at HFMA Health System. This is a AA rated uh, uh, organization. These are actual financial statements uh, that I uh, found on the internet on the Muni OS or MSRB website. I can't remember and in case you want to look up uh, financial statements of another organization, you can look uh, use either one of these two websites to access them at, uh, at no cost. So I retyped them here. And uh, let's see what we have. We have a statements of operations page. This is your income statement, followed by two pages of uh, balance sheets on the assets side here, the left side, and then the right side, liabilities and net assets. Then we have in here a consolidated statement of so changes in net assets. We are not reviewing this uh, uh, page. And uh, it is not, to my knowledge, it wasn't on the exam. Any questions related to it when I took it uh, uh, a few years ago? Then there is a statement or statements of cash flows. Uh, it's in here for completeness sake only. Uh, we 
are not going to talk about it today either. Then we have some footnotes here. They are integral to financial statements. I uh, selected the ones that I felt uh, to be of greatest use to you in a webinar series like this. But I'm going to go back to the income statement or the statement of operations here. And let's just go line by line and uh, and talk a little bit uh, about accounting here, everybody's favorite topic. Okay, so first of all, notice how this thing is organized. We have, first of all, operating revenues, and we have operating expenses, and then we have a line here called excess of revenues over expenses from operations. That is uh, the performance indicator, as it is called in the uh, uh, AICPA audit guide, capital P, capital I. Every organization has a performance indicator which measures profitability. And this one has a more complicated title rather than called uh, uh, income from operations. It has this fancier title called excess of revenues over expenses from operations. So that's an important line right there. And right underneath there, we have net non-operating gains. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. Then you get your, your total margin, your total net income here in this line, and this is in millions. So this is almost a half a billion dollars of, of net income. And then we have some reconciling items here that reconcile net income for the year to the increase in unrestricted net assets. And we'll talk about what that is in just a moment. Then underneath there, I have done something that you wouldn't see in published audited financial statements. You see that I've actually moved a couple of footnotes directly onto the page, just simply to uh, not bury them in the back and, and make it easier to talk about them. We'll come back to this as well. So that's... Uh, Base. That's the, the geography of this page, but now we need to go and look at a level deeper. So operating revenues consists of three line items, net patient service revenues, that's the biggest, that's our patient care, a premium revenues, the next one uh, could either be a health plan, uh, the revenues, the, the, the health plan collected, um, or it could be uh, a system that doesn't have a health plan, but that uh, gets paid on a capitated basis for providing health care services. Uh, and those uh, revenues are never considered patient service revenues because no patient service has been rendered yet. These are prepaid health care services. That's what capitation is. And they have their own line item. They are not mingled with patient service revenues. Then we have uh, an other revenues line item and we will talk about that in a moment. That is also sometimes called other operating revenues and that is not to be confused with non-operating revenues or gains down here below. Then we have a bunch of line items for expenses, salaries and wages, benefits, etc. As you are aware uh, uh, personnel costs or human resources uh, account for about two thirds of healthcare expenses in a provider or organization. And, and that seems to be true here as well. Uh, maybe not quite, but it's a, it's a pretty big number. Then uh, you, you can see what some of the other line items are. There's a relatively big line item for supplies uh, and then we have a line item here for depreciation. Um, I um, point out to you uh, what depreciation is. It, it is a, an apportionment or allocation of uh, money that you already spent on, on, say, building a new atrium to a hospital or a new wing. And that money has uh, all been spent uh, a few years ago, but instead of uh, uh, considering that as an expense in the year, it uh, the money was spent, uh, we, in accounting, apportion that uh, capital expenditure to the years in which uh, we derive a benefit from that uh, capital asset. And that, that is what depreciation is and uh, it is a non-cash expense. So all of the line items here, the, the one 
that isn't costing us any cash is this one right here. Everything else is also basically a cash expense. Um, although you also will know that in, uh, we prepare financial statements like this on an accrual basis. And so it isn't necessarily dollar for dollar cash we've actually spent. But in this case of interest and amortization, that's a line item that has zero, zero cash in it that is just a, an allocation of past uh, expenditures to a current year. And notice that bad debt has a line item here also, a pretty big line item. This uh, financial statement is prepared uh, using the standard uh, that was in effect until two years ago, until December 2012, where bad debt was a line item on the expense side. Uh, what changed uh, in December 2012 is that net patient, that bad debts are now deducted from this line up above here. So, you know, it goes away down here and it's taken out of this number up here. Now, how that actually looks on a new financial statement, I can show you. I have that in here, I went the wrong direction. Here we go, page 13 in your book. Um, bring bring that up a little bit more. So this is the left side is how that uh, HFMA health system financial statement is organized. You have net patient service revenue up above, and then you have bad debt expense here. It's called provision for bad debt. It's the same thing. It's an expense, and uh, you see on the right, uh, uh, it, it is now moved from the expense side to a deduction from revenues up above. So there's more line items now on the revenue side of the income statement and one line less on the expense side. I wish I could tell you how the exam actually handles this, whether uh, the uh, exam questions have caught up with this change. And I don't know the answer to that. All I can say is that the uh, examiners aren't going to pull a trick on you uh, I, I think they would probably give you the information in a way that would uh, make it easy for you to choose the right approach. But uh, you may still want to know, or I think you really should know as uh, someone in healthcare finance, uh, that uh, bad debt is now a deduction from revenue. Okay, I'm going to go back to the income statement here and uh, talk about some numbers that we haven't talked about yet. And that, uh, the, I'm going to start by talking about this net non-operating gains number right here. What that is, uh, what that consists of are all of the items um, that contribute to income that have nothing to do with operations. So what could that be? This would be the performance of your investments, your foundation, if you have one. Uh, uh, it would include uh, interest dividends, it would include uh, realized uh, capital gains and realized capital losses from selling something at a gain or at a loss, and importantly, it also contains a change in valuation of your investments. The accounting rules demand that we state our uh, investments or a good portion of our investments at fair market value as of the balance sheet date. And if an investment has gained as it would have in the recent run up of the markets, you would recognize a, uh, an unrealized gain. It's not realized because you didn't sell anything but uh, you'd recognize an unrealized gain or you could also recognize an unrealized loss. And that is probably why the number here in the 2011 column is so much higher than in 2010. The organization, this HFMA health system had a lot more gains, not unrealized gains uh, in the year 2012 than in 2010 when the markets were still recovering from the Great Recession. So this is an important number and there's a ratio associated with uh, the mix of uh, income between operating income, this number here, and this number here, 
your non-operating income. And by the way, this is not called income. In this case, it's called gain because it's a, it's a net number. So, so uh, everything is netted into this number. So we, we don't here call it income, but it is in essence non-operating income. So the, comp the uh, split between these two, which looks like, uh, like a two to one split about between income from operations and uh, investment income realized or in unrealized, uh, there's nothing mm, good or bad about that. Uh, some organizations have no or very few uh, investments or uh, foundation assets, and uh, they have to survive by making uh, their margin on operations. And uh, you know, other organizations are fat with uh, uh, foundation monies, and uh, they use those assets well, or maybe sometimes they also rely on them more than they should. So there isn't really a right answer whether. Uh, a ratio that has more income from operations than non-operations is good or bad. It, it all depends. So that's uh, what non-operating, the non-operating line is. And then let's look at uh, other revenues up here. These are other operating revenues. So we need to distinguish those, as I said earlier, from um, non-operating revenues. Uh, and, and see what's in them. So it's a, not as big a number, but still a, a substantial number. It's actually bigger than the non-operating gains in this case. So what's in this number? Anything that isn't, that's revenue, but isn't in these other categories, it goes here. So what is it? Um, I can name a few items uh, that are in there. Uh, your medical office building, the rent your doctors are paying to lease office space, your uh, cafeteria, your parking lot, your gift shop, uh, your grants, uh, your clinical trial revenue would be in there. And there's got to be a bunch more in there as well. Uh, so it's non, it, it, it is non-patient service revenue, but it is revenue to your organization. And some of this revenue might if you are a not-for-profit organization, actually be unrelated business income, and you would be paying taxes on it. And that's the topic we will come to in our fourth webinar when we talk about uh, uh, compliance. So what is in here? Well, we're going to come to that more in a minute. Um, we are actually, I'm going to tell you what it is. Here, look at this note 11 at the bottom from footnote 11. Other revenues, which is that line item we're just talking about, contains 33 million and 34 million respectively of assets released from restriction. Okay, that's the next topic we're going to talk about uh, is uh, uh, what that means. And that is something that's on the uh, balance sheet. So let's move on to the balance sheet. First of all, you have your assets here. Um, we'll come back to the talk about line items here amongst these assets. I'm going to move along to the next page, to page 17 in your book, which shows the liabilities and net assets section, the right side, so to speak, of your balance sheets. So you have your liabilities, your current liabilities up above, your non-current or long-term liabilities here in the middle and uh, a total number for liabilities. And then underneath that is the net assets section of the balance sheet. Notice uh, that there are three components to it. Here they are. Unrestricted, temporarily restricted, and permanently restricted. All um, not-for-profit organizations will have those or, or could have those. They don't necessarily do. Uh, let's talk about what the difference between them is. Net assets is what we call uh, the, the, uh, the difference between assets and liabilities in a not-for-profit financial statement. So assets minus liabilities equals net assets. It's a number that uh, uh, is tied to income, net income, but there's a reconciliation 
required to tie it exactly to net income. Um, but within that, with that said, these, this net assets number has these components. In a for-profit world, this would be called net equity. And it wouldn't have this breakout. So what is unrestricted net assets in a not-for-profit organization? It's what a for-profit organization would call accumulated earnings. It's essentially what the organization started with on day one when it had some assets and probably no liabilities, you know, someone, an investor or a, a religious sponsor or a, a community uh, organized and started the healthcare organization and endowed it with some starting capital. That's where that would sit in this what this biggest number, this unrestricted net assets. And then added to that are all of the earnings from day one uh, accumulated and, and also the, 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 the losses would be taken away from this number. So, so this is the uh, kind of a historical picture of the starting capital plus the performance since then. Uh, and that sits in unrestricted net assets or, or net equity as it, or accumulated earnings as it would called in a for-profit world. Also in here, however, since we are a not-for-profit organization, we have donations, we have gifts of donors uh, added to this number as well in so far as they are unrestricted. So these aren't just earnings that we uh, achieved, but it's also money that we have been given since insofar as it has no restrictions, no strings attached to it. Uh, there are other kinds of donations that do have strings attached to them. Temporary restricted gifts or net assets are one of those. And these are gifts that a donor stipulated uh, uh, a purpose for and said, I want to have my name on the atrium of of the hospital and so here is uh, 10 million dollars to do that. That is a temporarily restricted gift once the atrium is built and the red ribbon gets cut and my plaque goes up on the wall my, with my, next to my photograph then that asset is no longer restricted. Is then an unrestricted net asset. A permanently restricted net asset has also has strings attached to it. it uh, the donor here stipulated that the corpus or the the principle of the gift not be touched and only the earnings of it can be spent. In academia, uh, an endowment of a professorship would be a permanently restricted net assets. That's how it would show up on a college's uh, financial statements. So all of this totals up to net assets. Now, what happens if uh, that $20 million or $10 million atrium gets built. What happens? So on the asset side here, when I got the gift, I, you know, I booked, uh, say, a $10 million gift as cash. So that's on the left side. On the right side of the financial statement, that gift was uh, uh, included in temp temporarily restricted net assets. Okay, so I build the atrium, the cash goes away, it's, it's no longer here, we paid the contractor, uh, and instead the asset, uh, that atrium is included now in property, plant, and equipment up here. So uh, on the left side, it gets reclassified from here to here, and on the, on the right side, and on the left side, it goes from cash to property, plant, and equipment. This uh, transaction bypasses the income statement. In other words, that gift is not income. It is not income. Uh, this is different from a gift, say, of uh, 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 meant to pay for uh, uncompensated care or for mammography screening, or we get a grant to, to do something. Those would be uh, monies that uh, get used in operations and those do go through the income statement. So these 
kinds of gifts in the year that they are uh, uh, used show up as revenue up here. So that's in part what is included. It's not just your medical office building rent, your cafeteria, your gift shop, your retail pharmacy, but it, it can also be uh, donations or gifts or grants for operating purposes. And that's what Dow explains this footnote here, this footnote 11, where a, a certain amount of money got uh, uh, transferred from restriction to unrestricted, it's now spent. Okay, so uh, that's what's going on there. Hopefully that uh, explains it to your satisfaction. Okay, so um, that's what's going on here in this net assets section. So essentially what uh, these numbers represent, the net assets numbers represent is how much of uh, the an organization's balance sheet, the organization owns itself. It, it, it's it's invest it, it's its own money at work. Because you see, the balance sheet is a much larger number. It's nine and a half billion dollars. Out of that, the organization owns a, a, a little bit more than half itself. The rest is is uh, financed uh, uh, through debt and through providing services and uh, uh, leveraging that investment uh, in, into an organization that uh, provides care on a, on a daily basis with, with money that uh, uh, it takes in and spends every day. So that's how the uh, net asset section work. We should go back though and talk a little bit about the uh, asset side, look what's all here. There's some cash here. There is some money that's set aside. Short-term management designated investments. We have a large number, large line item here for accounts receivable. And these are patient accounts receivable mostly, but potentially also some other receivables. Look how they are represented here. They're presented here as net of allowance for bad debt. So on the balance sheet side, we always have taken out uh, our uh, estimate of bad debt from the number. And, and what we are now doing on the income statement side is doing the same with revenue. We are now taking bad debt out. So in a way, we're being more consistent than we used to be. So let's talk about the, 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 the net in both of these numbers. The net here in accounts receivable and also the net here in patient uh, uh, service revenues. So you, you all know we charge incredibly high prices in healthcare. Uh, it's kind of like the rack rate uh, on your hotel room door, on the inside of the door, next to the, the lodging laws of your particular state. It says this room, you know, the, 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 the regular, price of this room is, you know, some astronomically high number. It's not the number that we really charge in the real world. And that's uh, what we start off with in healthcare are very high prices. Uh, and that is what we call gross revenue. When we uh, look at what we do, the services we render at those inflated high prices. But since those are not transaction prices, those are not really real we have to take certain things out and we take contractual adjustments out. That is uh, uh, an estimate of uh, what uh, the portion of our charges that insurances don't pay because we have a contract with them and they uh, have not agreed to pay us full price. They pay us less than that. So we take out the, the contractual adjustments. We've already talked about taking out bad debt. And the last thing we take out is uncompensated care or charity care as it's also called. So bear in mind that charity care never is revenue. It is just not. It's not care for which we expect to be paid ever. And so we don't call that revenue. Uh, um, picture a business office that has a charity patient identified up front, let's say, as, a, as an indigent patient 
patient has a $10,000 bill, what does the business office do at time of billing? It writes it off. It zeroes out the $10,000 account. It's now zero in accounts receivable, and uh, that same transaction reverses the revenue as well. So there's no revenue associated with the charity patient. So that's, that's what's happening on the revenue side. It also happens on the, on the balance sheet side that is zeroed out. So there's no charity in here, and uh, we also take the bad debt out. So where does charity go? Do we even report it? The answer is yes, we report it and we report it. I'm going to have to scroll here to the footnote on charity care. Here it is, footnote I. Basically it says that we provided uh, blah 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 dollars, x dollars. I'm not showing you what the numbers are. Um, a certain amount of charity care and that is reported at cost at cost we don't report charity at gross there is no such thing as net for charity we simply report it at cost that is a fair a fairer way to uh, represent community benefit than any other way so charity care is disclosed in, in a footnote what else is there here to talk about? Let's uh, complete our discussion. Um, we have some other receivables, supplies, relatively small number. We'll talk more about supplies here in a moment. Then we have some line items that we don't really need to worry about. This assets held under securities lending um, and the current portion of funds, funds held by trustee. We're not, we don't need to talk about those here. The financial statements that uh, you would encounter as a data set on an exam question would not be this complex. They would have far fewer line items, but I chose to give you a, a nice complete financial statement here just so you see what it actually looks like in real in real the real world. Now notice that this organization, HFMA Health System, also has quite a bit of money. Uh, some of it cash parked as a non-current asset on its balance sheet. Let's look, compare that with the cash they have and short-term investments here. They have way more parked down here as a, a non-current asset. That is a liquid asset if management changed its mind and redesignated it, it could easily move up here. Bear that in mind when you're looking at the current ratio, which looks at the ability of an organization to pay its short-term bills. The, the organization actually has more current assets if it wants to have them than they're actually showing here. Then property, plant, and equipment we've already talked about is shown here at net. It's shown as net, uh, as net of accumulated uh, depreciation. And again, what I'm doing here is pulling the accumulated depreciation number forward to show you how much uh, has already been written off uh, in the past. Now, one ratio is kind of a neat one. It's not a particularly important one, is the one for the average age of plant, which is derived by taking uh, accumulated depreciate, uh, taking property, plant, and equipment and dividing it by, oh my goodness, I'm drawing a blank right here. Look, average age of plant is accumulated depreciation, which is this number down here, divided by depreciation expense up here, this number. And uh, what you get if you do this calculation is you get about 10 years. So everything the organization has, uh, the bricks and mortar it uses, is about 10 years old. That's similar to how an airline might say, you know, the average age of our airline or fleet is, you know, 4.7 years or so. It's kind of a nice thing to be able to see is the organization's plant aging or is, is it being rejuvenated and replaced? You can figure that out via this very nice ratio called average age of plant. Looking uh, just very briefly here on the liability side to see what we've got there. Okay, this organization has some debt. Here it is. A uh, piece of that debt is uh, payable this year. 
and the current, I haven't mentioned this yet, generally refers to assets or liabilities that uh, uh, that have maturities of a year. Anything that goes beyond a year is considered long term. So 48 million is due this year, the, the, the still leaves 1.7 billion in debt to be paid uh, later. Then you have the typical candidates here on the payable side, accounts payable, accrued compensation. I mentioned earlier, financial statements are pre prepared on an accrual basis. I'll give you an example. On December the 31st, um, uh, employees had worked say a week into a pay period. They were last paid right around Christmas time. They've now worked an extra week they're not going to be paid until early January. So the money that they earned before December 31 sits in accrued compensation. Hasn't been paid yet, but it, it, it will be paid shortly. Uh, this line item here, payable to contractual agencies, um, refer to settlements that uh, a health system or health systems via the cost report do with CMS and, and other organizations as well. In this particular case, HFMA Health System estimates that it was overpaid by $71 million in past years and, uh, uh, has, uh, and uh, is going to get a bill from uh, CMS for that money via a settled cost report and, and so they're estimating that here. This could also be an asset depending on how the, 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 this calculation goes. All right, so that's basically what we have and uh, I want to stop here and ask if uh, anyone has a question at this point. I, I don't see any hands raised except for Nick. So Nick, do you have a question? Sorry, okay, I forgot I'm just, to unmute. Oh, Nick. I'm, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nick. I, I don't know why I keep I, I don't know why it keeps doing that, but I don't have any questions. It keeps okay. flipping okay. back to them for some reason. Uh, Okay, and so I do when see I, another. When I raise my hand next time, disregard it. Okay, <laughs> will do. We we do have another question, Christoph. Uh, John Wagner. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hi, John. Hi, John. <clears throat> hey, uh, quick quick question for you. So, if you have a patient that doesn't get uh, charity care allocation until let's say yes. six months after billing, yes, where does that go? Ah, it. Uh, Pardon me. It uh, you know it it might be a, a charity determination that is made later. Um, so that account would sit in accounts receivable here uh, uh, as uh, at, at its full rate at its full rate unless the hospital already uh, uh, per se wrote off a portion of a self-pay patient's bill immediately, but assuming they're not, it would sit at full, it's full $10,000 here. It would sit in its, at its full $10,000 or yeah, also in patient service revenues. Uh, so organizations uh, might estimate this also. In other words, they may, they may realize from past experience that after the fact, they uh, still find charity and uh, they may have built that into this calculation so that at the balance sheet date when these financial statements are reported, uh, they may have already taken out money for expected charity that hadn't been identified yet and also taken it out of accounts receivable. Okay, so if that answers your question, I'm going to um, motor right into the discussion then of ratios, which is what we're really all about here. And I'm going to do that by going to page, right here, page 24. This uh, portion of the book from page 24 to page uh, 29, earmarked that dog-eared dog somehow 
put a sticky note in there, make a photocopy of these pages, because this will be very useful in studying and learning ratios and, and cramming for the exam. That way you don't have to schlep the whole book around with you as you are doing your last study. I also want to let you know that there is a, a wonderful web app, uh, 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 smartphone app called uh, Quizlet, which you can download for free through iTunes, Quizlet. Um, it is a shell in which users can insert electronic flashcard content and help uh, and, and help themselves learn memorize something. So one of uh, First Illinois Chapters members, Tim Stadelman, has done that, uh, has found this app and inserted in it a beautiful set of electronic flashcards, so to speak, with racial formulas and other CHFP exam content. So I encourage you, if you, if that, if it suits your learning style, uh, to download Quizlet and then enter uh, uh, CHFP into it and this content that Tim has put in there will pop up for you. There's several modules uh, on not just on ratios, but on other aspects. He's got variances in there, the revenue cycle. It's beautiful. So what we're doing here on page 24 and 25 is kind of getting the lay of the land of the ratios as they are included in this curriculum. And then starting on page 26, we do the formulas. It's always good to start with the roadmap. So look at page 24, please, and um, we'll cover ratios that way. So notice that there are different uh, uh, classes of ratios, profitability ratios, liquidity ratios. There's six of those, I think, capital ratios, five or six. Yeah, five, and then there's one, the sixth one called lesser used ratios, which you can safely forget about at my Average favorite average age of plant is one of those lesser known ones. So there's these five types of ratios. Uh, I have a column here that uh, tells you whether you should learn those ratios or whether you can safely skip them. Then I am telling you where the information comes from, the income statement or statement of operations exclusively the balance sheet in these ratios down here exclusively, or in some cases, you use a little bit of both uh, racial numbers that come from uh, different places in the financial statements. Then in my last column, I uh, indicate whether up is good or up is bad. If there's nothing there, it means that it's neither good nor bad. Uh, the answer in that case is it depends. Then here on the left, I give you a, a concise, uh, brief definition of what the ratio actually does. So it's not just the name, but a brief description of what it does. Notice that this uh, fifth category, I used to call it um, commonly used operating indicators. I've now added three words to that, four measuring utilization. These are utilization measures specific to healthcare. They are used by financial analysts. They, they look at these ratios also and they are tested on the exam. That's why at least most of them you see I have, uh, there's one there that that isn't used, but uh, you need to learn these as well. So that's the lay of the land. And then, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, Valerie. this is Valerie. Um, go ahead. Would you like to do a, a poll question or two? Since I we haven't could do begun? that. Okay. No, we haven't done polling questions. Um, and I think you're right. We should do some right now. Thank you for the reminder. I was going to wait, but let's do some polling questions. Let's do polling questions one through five. Okay. I also have them up on the screen here. 
but you're going to, uh, participants, you're going to see this in a special window. Okay, uh, poll question number one, it should be up on your screen. Uh, financial statements include, and please select one. Okay, we have about 87% voting. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Thank you. And um Okay, interesting. See. I see Can you the see answers. the poll results? I can. Yes, uh, in a little box on my screen here. I can't see the percentages, but I can see that the majority of people answered A. Well, that is yep. I'm sorry that is not the right answer. The right answer is D. Okay, we had 18 percent. Okay, that is uh, D. Thank you. Um, charity care is disclosed at cost in the footnotes. I showed you the footnote in the in the financial statements. Now, why are the other answers not right? And I'm going to uh, not even go to C because I don't think anybody answered that. Or very few people did. The uh, A and B are very tricky. Uh, in, in how they are worded. There is no such thing as a statement of changes in net assets and operations. It doesn't exist. So I trick you on that one. There's also no such thing as a statement of changes in net assets and equity. All right? So I trick you on, I, I got you, I got you. Now here's another gotcha question. This first one, uh, Valerie, if you close that for a second before you show the next one. Okay. Um, showing closed. Is that there you go. Okay. Okay. We're back to the my screen here. Just okay. for a moment. Okay. Okay. And then I'll I'll ask you to show the next one in a minute. Uh, I sometimes use this first polling question. I I didn't for this particular webinar because it has nothing to do with healthcare. But look at this question for a moment. A baseball and a baseball bat together costs a dollar ten. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, the, whenever I show this, the majority of participants answer B. And uh, why do they do so? Well, it's first of all, it's not the right answer. Let me show you the right answer. I have it here. Here's the calculation. If the ball is X, then here's the, the algebra to do the math. You can do this on your own, but it's five cents for the ball. Uh, why do so many people get something like this wrong? Um, is because we all have, as human beings, the tendency to um, uh, short circuit the, uh, the math and, and go straight away to an answer that feels right. And that's a, a, a tendency or uh, part of human nature that exam writers obviously exploit, and uh, they can they they can do that in many different ways by asking questions that confuse you, that are double negatives, and that have the word except in it, and so forth. So uh, the, that will also the, you will experience this also on the exam. So read the question obviously carefully and take your time in answering it and. Uh, and if something is uh, somewhat confusing, it is likely to be meant to be confusing. Let's do the next polling question in that case, please, Valerie. Okay. So the next poll question is gifts to a hospital from its foundation are? Yes, always recognized as revenue, never recognized as revenue, sometimes recognized as revenue.
Okay, we have 91% uh, voting, so I'm going to close that and share the results. So it looks like 57% uh, have chosen option C, or the third option there, 57% sometimes recognizes revenue and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. And that is the right answer. Yes, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. If uh, a gift is spent on a capital asset, it is not considered revenue. If it's a gift for operations, then it is considered revenue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more question. We'll do two more questions. Question number number three. It's listed as number four on my sheet here, but it's number three in your polling sequence. Okay. When trading securities are marked to market, please select one. Okay, I'm going to close that. We have about 80% voting. And 48% have chosen unrealized gains, losses are included in non-operating income. 45% realized gains, losses are included in non-operating income. And 8% have chosen unrealized gains and losses bypass the operating statement. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you all for answering that question. Uh, you have to read the question very carefully in order to pick the right answer on this one. Notice that the question asks, when are trading securities marked to market? They are when uh, you're talking about unrealized uh, gains and losses. In other words, you haven't sold anything. And thus, uh, A is the right answer. Unrealized gains and losses are included in non-operating revenue. Now. Uh, the second answer, B, is right also, except it's not the answer to the question. Let's do uh, the next polling question. It's something we haven't talked about. Do the best you can on it, and then we'll talk about it uh, afterwards. OK. So the next poll question, the revenues and expenses in financial statements in the preload, pre-reading are organized according to A. Functional classification or natural classification? Okay, we have 88% votes, so I'm going to close that one. And we have 80% showing functional classification and 20% natural. Okay, it's actually the other way around. Uh, go please to page, to page 15. Here we go. Actually, I'm going to show it to you bigger. Here we go. Okay, this gives me an opportunity to talk about the difference. 
notice that I had pulled, pulled uh, footnote 13 here into the bottom. Okay, so that is, so it is correct that there is a functional um, uh, breakout of expenses here, but that if that's a footnote. The main classification of expenses up here is is a natural classification. What what do we mean by that? A natural classification follows the natural organization of the general ledger into various buckets like salaries and wages and benefits and so forth. They uh, tell you what the main categories are, but they, they don't tell you what those expenses were for uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the mission and the performance of the organization, uh, particularly general and administrative expenses, which are overhead expenses, are of interest to investors. So you organize uh, in a footnote generally uh, the expense side of the income statement also functionally. So you have a big number for healthcare expenses. In this case you have, you also break out purchased healthcare services. These are services rendered by others on behalf of the organization and then general administrative expenses. It, it gives a picture of just how much overhead an organization has and uh, also in for-profit organizations insofar as companies do this they, they might break out particular product lines in, in, out of their consolidated statements and show it although frequently they're reluctant to do so. So this is something that's there for the benefit of financial statement users and it's called a functional description or functional classification. So thank you for answering those and we have some more questions here in a moment and if I uh, don't, in, uh, don't start them soon, Valerie, I ask you to help me and interrupt me again. Okay, will do. Thanks. So here we, okay, now we're going to, to the formulas. Finally, you say, finally, we're going through the formulas. So what I'm going to do uh, is um, go back and forth here between these this page, these pages here in your text, and then we're going to look at the numbers also that go into them. So we're going to talk in this first section about three. We're going to talk about operating margin, return on total assets, and return on equity. Those are guaranteed to show up on the exam. There are some others that could also show up, but let's do, we can't talk about them all. So operating margin, that's your performance indicator, total operating revenue minus total operating expenses, which is the same as operating income divided by operating revenue. Let's take a look. look. Okay, so what I'm showing you here side by side is uh, the financial statement that you're familiar with. And then I'm showing you, you here on the right, uh, a page from, the, it's, this is actually the solution to a case study or a couple of case studies uh, that we, if we were in a room together, would be doing together. But uh, since we are not, we're just going to go to the solution. This is on page 356. So page 356 is a spreadsheet that solves or answers all of these ratios using the numbers out of the financial statements on the left. So let's look under operating margin, what numbers we're using. You see 330 million 215, that's right here. It's the excess of revenues over expenses from operations. We divide that by total revenues, gains, and other support. You've got the formula here also in that spreadsheet, so we don't actually need to go back to page 24 to look at what the formula is. I can send this spreadsheet to Brad and he can um, send it out to you. Actually, what I would do is send the spreadsheet without any numbers in it, which is the case study template, so that you can use it to practice answering ratios and uh, you can also 
use it on in in your work if it if if you have occasion to calculate ratios and you want a, a nice template you can use this so that's operating margin no more needs to be said 4.1 percent for HFMA health system 4.2 percent the year before that's that's good that's not bad for a not-for-profit health system um, return on total assets ratio number six defined as net income divided by total assets net income is total income from operations and non-operations 485 million divided by total assets from the balance sheet you can trust me on this number I'm not going to show it to you on the left for a uh, return on total assets of 5% the year before 4.2 percent. The reason that has increased is that there is uh, uh, so much um, be because the non-operating uh, income has done so well in the second year compared to the first. Notice that uh, this number kind of moves in tandem with operating margin. So if you have a positive operating margin, you're also going to very likely have a total return a uh, return on total assets that's positive return on equity is going to be higher why because you take the same total income number but you're dividing it by a smaller denominator only the net assets piece the portion the organization owns of itself so to speak so you get a higher return 9.5 percent uh, that's also sometimes called the return on invested capital Okay, that's quite good. That's better than not quite as good as the stock market, but uh, quite good. So that's uh, the that's all we have to say about profitability ratios. And if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand and uh, interrupt me. If not, I'm just going to continue to go through ratios by looking at liquidity ratios. And I want to look at three ratios here. First of all, current ratio. Krista? Second of all, yes, go ahead. I'm Valerie. sorry, this is Valerie. Um, we do have some questions um, that are showing up in, uh, not with the hand raise, but with the other questions. Um, just yes. a clarifying question, um, and this one may have already been answered. It was uh, John Wagner. Interest is allocation of past expenditures and a non-cash item, correct? How does this differ from the interest seen in the net operating gains. Has that one already okay. been addressed? No, please read that one again. Okay. Um, interest is allocation of past expenditures and a non-cash item, correct? How does no, this depreciation. differ? Depreciation is not interest, depreciation. Okay. Okay, so maybe that uh, answers the first part, but there's more. there was more to it. Um, how does this differ from the interest seen in net operating gains? Oh, okay. Um, well, there's a couple. Yes, okay. Yes, I think I understand. Uh, uh, um, is there an interest line? Yes, there's an interest line here, right? Okay, so interest on this line, interest on this line here, is interest that the organization paid on its debt. Okay, so remember the organization has $1.7 billion on debt. This is the interest paid to bondholders. The interest that is here in non-operating gains, that is interest earnings, from investments that the organization owns. Okay. All right. uh, and, and then we've had a question um, to further define um, or please define net in relation to gross and interest. Net and gross relating to interest? Uh, oh, define boy. net in relation to gross and interest. Oh. Let me repeat that again. Define net in relation to gross and interest. Yes, that was the question. Okay. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, I think I explained the difference between gross and net. Gross is charges at list prices minus uh, various items, three different items that come out, charity, bad debt, and contractual allowances. 
not sure how that is related to interest. Okay, I'm going to um, unmute, is it Sunita? Do you still have the question? Okay, I'm not, I'm not hearing anyone, so um, okay. we'll move on. Um, then, yes. could you repeat the website that you mentioned um, that that you could the app that you could download? Yes, it's called Quizlet. 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 Okay. Yes, and it's an app. It's a free app uh, in iTunes. Okay. Quizlet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one last question. Um, the average age of plant formula, could you repeat that one? Yes, the formula is accumulated depreciation divided by depreciation expense. You want to see the formula, you can see it right here, okay? So it's going to be a little bit small, but ratio 34 is that a average age of plant formula and here's the calculations 10.3 years average age for the HFMS health system was 10.8 years the year before okay we, okay I'm going to uh, and we do have one more question oh, I'm sorry, go for it. yes absolutely <laughs> no, no, no. Um, um, Jeff Nelson is wondering uh, if our Neeson what is will we be asked if the percentages indicate performance, for example, ROI equals 9.5%, and that would be considered above average compared to other hospitals. Oh, no, I don't think you would see that. Uh, you're not going to see, you're not going to be asked that. Uh, that kind of information is a little bit hard to come by sometimes. Oops, wrong place here, sorry. Uh, okay. Let me show you. I have in the study guide here. Here we go. A uh, um, information I scraped off the Moody's website. You can't copy it. You can't download it. You can't even screen print it. But I I entered it into this spreadsheet here to show you what uh, the performance per Moody's is uh, median performance. Uh, HFMA used to publish this information. Maybe they still will. But uh, they usually update this on their website in December, and they haven't yet for last year. So. I went and found this, uh, the most current information uh, I could lay my hands on it is from Moody's. No, this is just for you to, to get a feel for what uh, happens. Let me see, operating margin, look at the first item, the median, two and a half, two point seven percent. This health system has over four percent. Okay, so here are some medians, you don't need to learn these. Or, memorize them. Okay, I am going to go back to uh, our discussion of the, the ratios, formulas, and the application to this financial statement. Current ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. It measures the liquidity of an organization, its ability to pay its current obligations with current uh, uh, resources. 1.3, that doesn't seem like a whole lot, was 1.3 the year before, but remember how many uh, um, non-current assets that are liquid this organization has. I talked about this two, $2.5 billion parked for uh, management designated purposes, probably to install an EPIC system. It's probably the, the cost of an EPIC system as well. So that's the current ratio. Let's talk about the net days in patient accounts receivable. It's the last one there on the, the right. I'm going to make it bigger so we can see the formula better. Here we go. The, 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 the totally correct name, the completely correct name for that ratio is days net revenue in net patient accounts receivable days net revenue in net patient accounts receivable. That's kind of a mouthful. So typically we just call it net days or days in AR. The formula it essentially it determines how many days worth of unpaid business sit in our receivables 
And in the case of this HRMA health system, it's almost 50, yeah, it's around 50. How is it calculated? Net patient accounts receivable, you know what that number is. Uh, and on the, the, the number in the square brackets, so the, the, the denominator here in the square brackets is average daily net revenue. Uh, in this older formulation, you still have to take bad debt expenses out because it's a below the, the line expense rather than a deduction on the revenue line from gross revenue. So this is the formula, the way it's in the online study guide, and this is the way I would learn it, except that I think what you need to be aware of that, the, that you may not have to reduce bad debt expense because it's already taken out of net patient service revenue according to the new rules. But I think the exam would help you and not uh, uh, try to trick you on that. So this is a formula guaranteed to show up on the test. Okay, moving along here, days cash on hand. Let's talk about ratio 13 here. This is important for, particularly important for investors, uh, and it's also important for health systems or, or uh, creditors because the bond covenants uh, typically stipulate how many days cash on hand an organization needs to have to stay in compliance with its, its its, its bond covenants. That could be 75 days, 90 days, it could be more than that. In the case of HFMA health system, they essentially have, they could operate for 168 days without taking in another dime of money. They could pay their vendors, their employees, uh, without collecting anything more, just by liquidating what they already have. And so what is it that they have? cash, they have marketable securities. In this particular case, I'm also saying count unrestricted long-term investments here, but uh, actually that is, if you wanted to be completely correct about it, here we're looking at the formula here. Notice that, and we're on page 27, where all the formulas are explained with all these arrows and, and side notes, that I circled unrestricted net assets and say, telling you for purpose of the exam, don't do this, okay, don't put that in here. I kind of added it because I think it should be there, but uh, uh, because in practice it is, but uh, uh, the way the formula and the guide, the HFMA guide says this don't count it. All right. Okay, so days cash on hand. So what's in the square brackets here in the denominator? Operating expenses minus depreciation. That is basically cash expenditures. Basically, it's a, a way to convert in, in, in a very simple way your operating expenses to a cash basis. You take out depreciation, which as I've now several times said is a non-cash expense. You divide by 365. So this is your, your daily burn rate of cash in the denominator and uh, yeah, we already said that this organization can operate almost a year and a half without collecting another dime. Moving on to the capital structure ratios, these of course are also interest of interest in investors who want to know is this organization going to be around in 20 or 30 years when, when the last of my bonds bonds that I own mature and will I get my money back. There's a lot of ratios here. The ones that are important are highlighted or marked for you. I'm just going to highlight three of them or actually two of them, namely this ratio 16 here, oops, and ratio 20. Look at the formulas. Uh, what are we measuring here? We're measuring the leverage of an organization, essentially how how much, how well are their liabilities covered by, by what the organization actually owns in terms of net assets. So it's a half about, so half of their liabilities. Uh, so no, I take that their liabilities account for half of their net assets. So the net assets, it's basically uh, cover long-term liabilities twice over. Um, so it's a, it's a ratio of around 0.5. In this other ratio, debt capitalization, it's similar, 
uh, it's got net assets in the denominator. Uh, the difference in the numerator is that in one case it's long-term liabilities, in the other case it's total debt, which also includes, you see this here in the numbers, you could uh, uh, find that here in your, uh, on the liability side, you have your current portion of long-term debt here, your master trust debt reclassified as short term. So you have all of your debt here, uh, everything you owe to bondholders, not just your long term debt. That's, that's one difference between these two formulas. The other is that in this ratio 20 debt capitalization, you also add total debt to the denominator. And why do you do that? Well, you get a quite different answer. You get a much lower ratio here, you got 51% uh, uh, here on this ratio, this would actually be even higher if I included my uh, my uh, short-term debt in there, which I'm not, um, and, and here I, I get 30%. So in order to demonstrate the relationship between these two ratios, I personally find this a little bit difficult. So I set up here a page, this is in your book, uh, page 30, a, a comparison between these two ratios, 16 and 20. Notice on these uh, various scenarios, the balance sheet doesn't change. It's 200,000 on both sides, assets and liabilities. The only thing that changes is the composition here of, uh, non-current liabilities and net assets. And notice that uh, this first case here is similar to HFMA Health System. One ratio is a 0.5, the other one is a 0.33. As I shift non-current liabilities and net assets, my uh, long-term debt to equity ratio goes higher and higher. It goes over to one and then a two and higher. The debt to capitalization ratio never quite reaches one one is the, the very limit it could reach. So it's just a different way, slightly different way of measuring leverage of an organization, just to show you that relationship between the these two ratios. I put this on a particular extra page here. If you have any questions, let me know. Meanwhile, I'm going to go back to the calculations here. Okay, let's so I would say we're done with the capital structure ratios. Moving would you right like to do the next not, polling, poll question, Christoph? Uh, not quite yet. Not Let quite? See. Okay. No, not quite yet. Um, okay. Just, I'll, I'll put a knot in my hanky so I don't forget. Activity ratios are um, all easy, they're easy because notice that you always have operating revenue in the numerator and uh, just a different balance sheet number in the denominator. What are we measuring here? We're measuring, it's called, these are called turnover ratios. They're really efficiency ratios. How well am I employing my assets to generate revenue? Um, am I efficient in my use of ra assets? And you know, what defines efficiency, you'd have to look up in Moody's to see what the median is. Let's see what the total asset turnover for HFMA health system is, it's 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So they don't quite uh, 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 translate or convert their assets into operating revenue in a, in a year's span, not quite. Uh, the, the numbers get smaller in the denominator. Fixed assets, you know, it's a much smaller number, so you get a, a higher turnover ratio. For the next one, which is current assets, it's even higher. And look how high it is for inventory turnover. Incredible. That number really kind of sticks out. So what's going on here with that number? You and I know that organizations, Organizations, healthcare organizations don't turn over their total inventory that often, 65 times a year. Maybe they, they uh, materials management, the supply chain turns uh, the inventory over maybe once a month. I'm not sure. Uh, so what's going on here? We are div the reason this number is so high is we are dividing the inventory, which is. Uh, 
uh, on the assets. Here it is, supplies inventory, this number on the current assets by a very, very high number. We're dividing it into all of our total revenues, not just, say, our surgery revenue or our pharmacy revenue, but total revenue. So we get a ratio that, if calculated consistently, is going to be comparable across organizations. It just doesn't represent reality. We're not making widgets here and putting them in a warehouse and shipping them. We are using inventory or supplies to make people well. So it's not that important of a ratio, but I just wanted to show you how uh, a mathematical computation might not represent reality on the ground in, in a materials management operation in the healthcare organization. Let's do the, the questions now, and then we will do the utilization indicators last. Okay, so you want to do the next poll question? So Valerie, will you show us the next? Okay. So the next poll question is, the following is an example of a capital structure ratio. Okay, we have about 84%, 85% voting. I'm going to close that. And we have 83% have chosen um, selection three, long-term debt to equity ratio. Perfect. We have 12% 12, 12 on the return on total assets. We have 3% return on equity and 2% total equity turnover. Very good. C is the right answer. Uh, return on equity, return on total assets where they have uh, uh, balance sheet terms in them and thus suggest maybe they have something to do with capital structure. They're actually profitability ratios. And D, total equity turnover, there's no such thing. I made it up. Okay, next okay. question, question number six, right? Okay, to convert financial statements from an accrual basis to a cash basis, you. Okay, we have about 85%, 86% voting. I'm going to close that. Okay. And we have 77% of responding to subtract depreciation and amortization from expenses and 23% to add depreciation and amortization to expenses. Yes, thank you. Uh, the correct answer is A, uh, to, to convert to a cash uh, view of operations, you take out depreciation. Now we didn't have, before we do the next question, uh, Valerie, just uh, give me back the screen for a moment then I'll talk briefly about amortization, what that is. 
okay, here on the left, I know this is kind of small. I'll make this bigger. Make it bigger than that. Okay, notice that, uh, you know, we talked about depreciation as a non-cash expense right here. And then there's a line interest and amortization. And we already talked a little bit about what this interest is. This is interest that HFMA Health System pays on its bonds. What we haven't talked about is amortization and what it is. Amortization uh, means uh, to, to extinguish, really, to, to make go away, I guess you could say. So what is it that you're making to go away in this particular case? Well, it used to be that when organization A bought organization B and paid uh, uh, a great deal of money for organization B, the underlying assets and uh, the net equity of the organization acquired might have been a lot less than what the acquirer paid for all of it. Uh, they paid a market price or negotiated price for organization B that may be a lot higher possibly than the book value of everything on that uh, organization B's balance sheet. It could be that they paid a multiple of earnings, say, and that that wouldn't have anything really to do with the balance sheet. So what organizations used to do is they would amortize the excess of um, purchase price over the book value of the underlying assets over a period of years. That used to be called goodwill. It was the goodwill that you acquired when you bought another company. You would amortize it over up to 40 years. Now we don't do that anymore. Instead, organizations are allowed to uh, value the acquired organization for whatever they paid for it, but then they have to undergo a uh, what's called an asset impairment test. They have to ask themselves periodically, is that thing we bought still worth as much money as what we paid for it or not? If, uh, if not, then you have to write down the value of the organization and you do that, you call that amortization. Since you already spent the, the money on it, it's like buy, uh, purchasing or building a capital asset. The money's already spent. You're just recognizing some of that price uh, in a current period. So that's what amortization here is. There's another meaning to amortization that we don't need to concern ourselves with, but it, that's uh, mainly what, what uh, what we're talking about here in this particular case. So we do one more polling question, Valerie, and then we're done with our uh, complement of polling questions for the day. Okay. The last polling question is, what is the formula for inventory turnover? Okay, we have about 81%, 82% vote. I'm going to close that. We have 20% uh, for operating expenses divided by inventory. We have 65% for net revenue divided by inventory. 8% responded inventory divided by net revenue. And 7% responded inventory divided by operating expenses. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you all. The right answer is B. Um, you, if Val, Valerie, you take me back to uh, my screen, you can see it. See it in just a moment. 
on the right there, on the white say, side of it, rate, uh, ratio 24, there it is. Total operating revenue divided by inventory. Okay, so we've done our case, uh, uh, our polling questions. We just have one segment to, uh, to discuss, which are the, uh, the utilization indicators. Uh, Chris, just, just one um, quick reminder. We have about sure. five minutes left on the uh, webinar time. So okay. just wanted to, to let you know that. Thank you. That mm -hmm. should be just enough time to do the utilization indicators and then we'll call it a day. Length of stay. Everyone knows what length of stay is. How is it calculated? Here's the formula for it. Inpatient days divided by total discharges. Let's see what it is. 4.2 for this organization. Occupancy rate. Uh, something else that we all hear. How is it calculated? That's what's crucial. Total inpatient days uh, divided by uh, staff at beds times days in period. Let's see what the value is. 74, 72% occupancy rate. <clears throat> An inpatient day, just to define that, is one inpatient in one bed over one midnight. There is a change in how CMS defines an inpatient day, but we don't need to concern ourselves with that right now. Why are we using staff beds rather than licensed beds? Well, we want to know how full the beds that we would like to have full are, not how many beds we possibly could uh, mobilize because they were licensed once upon a time when we were busier than we are now. So to make it more real, we use staff beds rather than uh, licensed beds in this calculation. Case mix index, uh, it's not something, it's, first of all, you can't calculate with the data provided. Um, and uh, But it's still nice to know what the formula is. So you're not going to do a calculation on the exam. You may not even be asked what case mix, indicate, case mix in, index is, but I think it's very good to know what it is. It's the case weight of every DRG, uh, the case weight of every DRG multiplied by the number of cases in that DRG. We're going to talk more about case weights in our third webinar when we actually determine an IPPS payment from scratch. So we're going to come back to this just so you know what the formula is. Here it is. Now let's talk about uh, adjusted admissions and adjusted patient days, ratios 28 and 29. I'm going to take us to the fuller discussion of that here in the front of the book on page uh, 28 and 29. Adjusted admissions and adjusted patient days convert our outpatient business to inpatient equivalents. In the one case, it does it with admissions, in the other with patient days. An admission is someone who's admitted to the hospital as an inpatient. A patient day, as I said a moment ago, is a, a patient in the bed at midnight, an inpatient. So we convert outpatient business to inpatient equivalents by the ratio of uh, gross charges to inpatient charges, or alternatively, you see in this what I call the more intuitive formula, the ratio of outpatient to inpatient charges. And that changes the formula a little bit. Ab make absolutely sure you know how this works, how you adjust admissions, and how you adjust patient days for, uh, for the exam. Okay, you notice that adjusted patient days is also sometimes called adjusted occupied beds. And then you can also calculate what uh, uh, FTEs per adjusted occupied beds are. You can even case mix adjusted on top of that. Not, not that you need to know that for the exam. Uh, one more thing you need to know, which is average daily census. And the formula for that is inpatient days times uh, uh, 365. So that's uh, average occupied beds. It's the same as this ratio up above divided by 365. So that brings us to the end of this um, challenging topic. We've motored through this entire topic here in one 
sitting and uh, I admire you for your uh, ability to concentrate for s this long. Christoph, we do have a question. A, yeah, go ahead. Um, Joshua Hudson? Yes. Joshua, you're unmuted. Oh yeah, uh, my my question was is all these uh, questions that we've gone through uh, in the session, like the the actual questions that we all had to click uh, questions or quick our yes. quick our responses. Will we get copies of those? Because I'm sure that's information that's pertinent to the exam, and it'd be great to have those questions and answers. I'm be happy to send that to you to you all. So I, I'm going to send you two things: this a blank spreadsheet for inputting numbers to calculate ratios and then the polling questions with answers. Excellent. Happy to do that. Okay, there's an exercise here, um, starting on page 32. Since we're out of time, I'm not gonna explain it. Uh, I encourage you to go through this exercise, however, because it will help you study. It's kind of like the Quizlet uh, app, app. In the first case, the first go around, I give you the formula, the ratio formula, and I ask you in the box to write in the, your, uh, the name of it and your description of what it does. The ones that have the check marks are the more important ones, the ones that I encourage you to learn. And then I give you a little bit farther in, and I'm scrolling there right now, here uh, where the asterisks are, it, you start the second half of this exercise where you have the name of the ratio and uh, I'm asking you to, from memory, put the formula into the box at the right. That's the level at which you will need to know ratios for the exam. Okay, we're at, we're at the end of things here. Uh, made it through all of this in one day, in two hours. I'm looking forward to see you again next week uh, where we talk about three quantitative topics under the budgeting and forecasting heading variances break even and cost volume profit analysis and uh, capital budgeting techniques. So until then, be well uh, and thank you again for participating today. Thank you, Christoph. Thanks, Christoph. Hey, this is Brad again. Just a quick reminder to everybody who's on here. Um, next week's webinar will again be at 1130 Eastern, but don't forget for most of the country, we have daylight savings time this weekend, so it'll be 1130 a.m. Eastern daylight time as opposed to standard time. So if you don't do daylight savings, that'll probably mess you up a little bit. Thanks, Brad. No problem. All right. Thanks, everybody. I will get this uh, posted out in the next uh, day or so uh, to the YouTube channel. Thank you, Brad.